good morning ladies and gentlemen and uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this very special conversation uh, tata steel kolkata literary meet and the bengal club library committee is very happy to present this special event brunch with amitav ghosh Sahitya Academy winner and Padma Shri Amitav Ghosh is the first English language writer to win the Gyan Peet award. He is the author of several acclaimed novels including The Hungry Tide, The Great Derangement, Gun Island and most recently The Nutmeg's Curse. Uh his latest book The Living Mountain is due to be officially released on May 12th, but we are lucky that he is here with us today to talk about this new book and the books are also available you can purchase them. They are not officially released but Since Mr. Ghosh is here with us today, we've managed to arrange a few copies of the book. Uh, he's been a long friend of the literary meet, and we are very, very happy to have him here with us today. Uh, he'll be in conversation with festival director Malvika Banerjee. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Ghosh and Malvika on stage, please. Good morning. Can you can everybody hear me at the back? Can you hear me now? Okay, I think we'll have to just speak really? slightly louder than we normally do. So good morning friends and good morning Amita. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sparing time in a very quick and rushed visit to Kolkata for this double header of sorts. So how do you feel being back here post pandemic? Well, it's a very strange feeling, you know, because uh, my mother died at the height of the pandemic in 2020 in August 2020 and I couldn't come. You know, so my my poor sister had to manage the whole thing, my sister and my niece. So, it was uh, really I mean that was uh, really a kind of uh, pandemic trauma, you know, not being able to come, being stuck over there. But uh Anyway, uh, you know, so I, this is the first time I've actually been able to come back because twice, uh, you know, I, I came actually in 2021 but I couldn't get past Goa because every time I came suddenly the numbers would shoot up over here and I had to go back. And every time you went back it shot up there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, so it's been a long uh, it's been a long long journey. Yes. Yes. Well, the I mean if it was a very dark cloud so I don't know about silver linings but if there was one is it is that you were very productive and uh, we actually had three books jungle nama then the nutmeg's curse and after that the living mountain so we did all these sessions online not the living mountain and it's wonderful to uh, you know have you live and in front of us I believe the new term is IRL <laughs> in real life so it's wonderful to welcome you back IRL <laughs> well thank you very much it's uh, it's wonderful to be doing this event for uh, the living mountain it's the first so it's kind of like a book release <laughs> yes uh, so i was wanting to just roll back a little and start with the nutmeg curse so we've had the privilege of speaking about each of your books at the kolkata literary meet so uh, and the books are inextricably linked in many ways mm. so uh, just we'll start briefly with the nutmeg curse and then perhaps segue into the living mountain as we go along so the nutmeg curse what took you to this island this tiny little island which is part of a group of islands where the nutmeg is found our beloved uh, mesas javitri and jaifal if i'm not mistaken yes Yes. <coughs> well, what happened was the Indonesian Ministry of Culture uh they invited me to tour in Indonesia. 
and I love Indonesia. I've traveled a lot in Indonesia. I honestly think Indonesia is just about the most interesting country in the world. Um, and uh, the one part of Indonesia I hadn't been to was the Spice Islands, uh, because uh, that is Maluku, you know. Uh, because Maluku's actually not been accessible for a long time. They had these uh, communal riots, actually, starting around about uh, 2000. And, uh, you know, uh, clashes between uh, uh, Christians and Muslims, and uh, they, were, they were really bad, you know, in Ambon and uh, many places like that. So, uh, but by 2012, they had started uh, opening up a bit. And in 2016, when they asked me, I said, well, uh, I would like to go to these Spice Islands. So they said, fine. And uh, my God, I mean, they did it on such a grand scale. I mean, they sent like advanced parties. And I was traveling with like a dozen people in my entourage. <laughs> so it was a kind of extraordinary experience. But then, so I ended up in the, uh, you know, I went uh, to uh, Ternate and Tidore, which are the islands that uh, were the islands of the clove, the original islands of the clove. And then I went to the Banda Islands. And, you know, uh, I knew something about the history of uh, uh, these spices, but I didn't know much. And it was, in a sense, you know, that's the interesting thing about writing <coughs> Uh, travelogues, if you like, you know. That is, the land teaches you, you know, in some strange way. And it was while I was there uh, that uh, really the enormity of what had happened uh, on these islands uh, really dawned on me, you know. I mean that, uh, so what happened is that in 1621, so the Banda Islands, I mean, they're tiny, tiny islands. I mean, the biggest of them, uh, you can like, is like what a few miles uh, along, you know, you can walk across the whole island in a, in a day. So there are like five islands and actually, uh, you know, they're the, uh, they're the rim of a caldera that is a sunken volcano. And the volcano is still active and it's uh, sort of constantly spewing in the background. Uh, so these islands, tiny as they are, uh, because they had the nutmeg tree, and the nutmeg tree produces both the nutmeg uh, and mace. Mace is just the outer covering of the nutmeg. Uh, so uh, the people, the Bandanese people, historically tiny group, maybe about 15,000 people, uh, but they were very prosperous and they were a very enterprising trading community. They sort of ranged across the Indian Ocean and the islands drew people from all around the Indian Ocean, you know, Chinese, Arabs, Indians, Gujaratis. So, uh, so they were a very prosperous people because, uh, you know, way back, even, uh, 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 you know, before the common era, uh, nutmegs were circulating in, in Europe. In the Middle Ages, just a handful of uh, nutmegs uh, could buy you a house in, in Europe, you know, um, or, a, uh, or, a, or a ship. I mean, their price was just absolutely phenomenal. So, in fact, uh, you know, we always think that the, that the Portuguese came looking for India, but they really actually went looking for the islands of, uh, they really went looking for the Spice Islands, you know. And uh, actually, they reached the Spice Islands within 12 years of reaching India. Uh, and the Europeans wanted right from the start to impose monopolies on these spices, you know, trade monopolies. And that was not the way that trade happened in the Indian Ocean, you know. So the Dutch turned up uh, in the Banda Islands in, uh, in 1600, actually. And the moment their, their volcano saw the Dutch, it exploded, <laughs> which it did at regular intervals when it saw, saw Dutch ships. Uh, anyway, so the Dutch uh, arrived there, and they tried to impose, uh, again, uh, a treaty, a monopoly treaty. Of course, the Bandanese resisted. Uh, so in 1621, uh, the Dutch uh, governor general, a man called Jan Peterson Kuhn, uh, he took a fleet, uh, you know, of ships to the Banda Islands and basically murdered all the Bandanese, uh, murdered a, a large number, enslaved the rest, and, uh, uh, you know, starved the others to death. A few managed to escape, and actually there are now, uh, you know, hamlets and villages on other islands uh, which are traced back to the Bandanese diaspora. 
But, uh, you know, so it's such a ghastly story if you think about it that, you know, in every civilization there's always been this idea of a tree of life, you know, and the life-giving fruit, if you like. Uh, and it was for them, the, uh, you know, the tree of prosperity. But eventually it turned uh, into the most dreadful curse. I mean, they were just eliminated. Uh, and uh, so they were one of the first examples of the resource curse, uh, you know. And I was just talking with Rudra here. Uh, so what the, uh, what the Dutch had in mind is that after they had eliminated uh, the Bandanese, they put, into, they put into place this version of racialized capitalism, you know. They give the land to, uh, you know, basically white planters, and then they ship in all these slaves. And most of the slaves were actually from India, uh, you know. Uh, so they started operating this plantation system over there. And it's actually quite similar, I mean, except for the, uh, for the mass killings, it's quite similar to the way the tea industry starts uh, in India. So the amazing part of this uh, uncanny, you've called it an uncanny intersection between uh, your circumstances in Brooklyn, which apparently is also has Dutch uh, history attached to it, and your uh, investigation and studying this whole incident happened, uh, what, 399 years later during the pandemic. So uh, in many ways, this book, uh, you know, right through you kind of chronicle the story of the Dutch, and then from there you're going to other forms of colonization. But there is an underlying thread of the pandemic. So how, I mean, how did you feel writing this book? You know, you've mentioned, as you just mentioned, you know, your, your mother passed away, you were unable to come. So you'd often wondered how, uh, you know, plantation workers would be cut away from their families. And you know, you, there are echoes of the past and present right through this book. So how would you connect the pandemic and, uh, you know, all that we've been through these last two years to uh, the, the after effects of climate change? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> well, you know, I had been traveling a lot before the, uh, I mean, even in February of 2020, I was, uh, I, I, I was in California. Then I came back uh, to Brooklyn, uh, I think it was the first or second of March. And uh, my wife was then uh, in Virginia because her parents, were, uh, were there. her mother had died in January and her father was very sick, so she was away. And I was uh, literally all on my own, except that my son and, uh, and his partner live, uh, you know, in, in a part of our house. So, but there I was, and it was a very strange, uh, it was a very, very strange experience. Because uh, in, at that moment, in mid-March, uh, Brooklyn was absolutely the epicenter of the epicenter uh, of the pandemic. And my house is just uh, like, uh, you know, uh, a 10-minute walk to the Brooklyn Hospital, where literally they brought in these refrigerated trucks to store the bodies, uh, you know. So it was, a, it was a strange, uncanny, eerie, eerie feeling because suddenly the streets uh, of Brooklyn were completely empty. And all we would hear all day long were these ambulances, you know, thundering down. Uh, and uh, it, it was just so strange. And... I had just finished Jungle Nama, just started working on this book, and I became obsessed with this one, uh, with this one book uh, published in the late uh, 19th century, which describes, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the Banda genocide in great detail. But the book is in Dutch, <laughs> you know, and I don't, um, I, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't read Dutch. So what I, I, I somehow managed to find a PDF of the Dutch of this book, uh, and I downloaded it, and I would keep staring at it, and I, I would keep thinking, I want, this book has secrets, I want to know, you know. And it's something which really obsesses me, because a long time ago, I, I actually learned a very obscure language called Judeo-Arabic uh, to, to write a book <laughs> called uh, In an Antique Land. So I'm not one to be defeated by languages. Unfortunately, now we have uh, Google Translate. <laughs> so <laughs> what I did literally was that I, I would copy sections of this, uh, of this uh, Dutch text and feed it into 
uh, into Google Translate. And, uh, you know, in that way, I started sort of unlocking, if you like, uh, the mystery of this thing. But it was such a strange thing, really, because it was this intersection of these two non-human entities, you know, on the one hand, uh, the internet, uh, and the um, and the coronavirus, you know, both operating at a global scale, you know, but together they came together to, as it were, open a window for me, you know, and it was strange, especially because you know Brooklyn is uh, Broeckelen, uh, it was originally a Dutch uh, colony, and uh, you know New York was New Amsterdam, uh, and actually. Uh, it was uh, New York passed into British hands at exactly the time that Calcutta was founded in the 1660s. Uh, so it's, you know, so actually the curious thing is that the Banda Islands are one end of the Dutch Empire and the other end is actually New Amsterdam, uh, you know. So these techniques of mass slaughter which they brought to the Banda Islands were actually, they learned them, uh, they learned these techniques actually in the Americas, you know, where at the same time they were massacring uh, Native Americans, you know, on, on this vast scale. And I think it's really that, that enabled, if you like, uh, this mass slaughter in the Bandas. So you've then moved with the nutmeg from, uh, you know, the, the genocide, it can't be called anything yeah. else in the Banda Islands, to what happened, what you call terraforming. And the, you know, there's an interesting part about the buffalo and the, you know, the Native American and how they were almost symbiotic in their existence, and how all of that was uh, exterminated by, by settlers. So, you know, the term terraforming, uh, I will, I will admit to not having thought or heard of it before I read this book. So, I'm sure there are several others who would, you know, the deep relationship between what we today call climate change and what happened in the form of terraforming, if you can just talk us through that. Uh, sure. <clears throat> so uh, terraforming is a term that will be familiar to uh, me, uh, anyone who reads uh, science fiction uh, because the idea is that, you know, uh, well, like for example, what Elon Musk wants to do, he wants to go to Mars uh, and uh, transform, transform it into a ha habitable uh, place for human beings. But, uh, so the term terraforming actually came into use in the 1940s. Uh, there, was a, the, there was an American science fiction writer who invented it. So terra is earth and forming is, you know, earth forming as it were. But uh, the idea goes back a lot further than that because H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds is basically based on the same premise. That is, you know, an alien race comes to the earth and wants to exterminate all, all earthlings and then adapt the planet for their own use. But that idea was completely borrowed. And in fact, A.G. Wells' idea came from uh, Tasmanian history, where the British had literally done this. Uh, you know, they exterminated all the Tasmanians and then adapted uh, Tasmania for their own use. So, uh, you know, so this idea of terraforming actually has a very long history in colonialism, you know. We think of colonialism as only a, a sort of process of, of, of domination over other humans. But what is actually very interesting and very distinctive about new world colonization uh, is the use of non-human entities, you know? Non-human entities like disease, uh, non-human entities like um, uh, livestock. You know, one of, the most important, uh, one of the most important elements of the colonization of the Americas was their deployment of livestock. Because wherever they introduced, uh, you know, pigs and, uh, pigs and cows, uh, essentially the pigs and cows were the, uh, were the outliers, you know. They would invade uh, Native American settlements and they would make, uh, you know, Native American livelihood uh, impossible because Native Americans depended on forests, on free-flowing rivers and so on. Uh, so, so this this idea of terraforming uh, through through the use of livestock, uh, through uh, through the use of dams, you know, deforestation and so on, uh, was a very important aspect of uh, of colonization, and it's what makes that kind of colonization very different from the sort of colonization that we experience, because here. 
uh, terraforming was actually limited to certain areas. I would say uh, to the tea plantations of Assam, if you like. But also, th the one part of India that is really uh, most extensively terraformed uh, is Bombay. Uh, because Bombay, uh, you know, was six islands. And already starting in the, uh, uh, in the late 18th century, uh, they started filling in these islands, uh, you know, and making it into this kind of peninsula. Uh, so, uh, you know, the curious thing is, if you look now at the sort of continuities of, uh, these, uh, of, of this history uh, with uh, the present planetary crisis, it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of almost uncanny, really. Because what does Bolsonaro... I mean, the Amazon is our last hope it's the world's greatest carbon sink. And what does Bolsonaro want to do to it? Uh, he wants to take it all down, replace it basically with the monoculture of soya. And this monoculture of soya is not because they want to grow soya. It's because they want to, want to grow cattle. You know, so that's the whole point of it. They just want to take down the Amazon and create these incredible cattle farms, you know. So, you know, you see that entire colonial logic playing out again, you know, in real time in our era uh, with what is almost certainly going to be uh, catastrophic consequences for the world because uh, the, you know, the destruction of forests in Brazil has escalated at a, at a pace that nobody had expected, you know. Uh, these settlers have been setting wildfires uh, in, in the Amazon. And, even during the pandemic, you know, this strange sort of North American, uh, I mean, this strange American form of colonization through disease, you know. So disease, uh, I mean, the indigenous populations of the Amazon were uh, disproportionately hit by, uh, by COVID. You mentioned, you know, this uh, infected blanket. Yeah. You know, the missionaries uh, <coughs> just gave out these blankets that were infected from, patient, from those who had died to other communities to ensure that all of them were wiped out. Yeah, so, you know, this is... That just sounds particularly evil somehow. It's completely evil, but all of it is evil. Uh, because, uh, you know, so within the European sort of way of thinking, they would say that disease uh, is a non-human entity. And we have... It's in nature. And nature follows its own laws. But of course, Native Americans never accepted that. They said that you are weaponizing disease, which is, in fact, what they were doing. You know, they were weaponizing disease in multiple ways. That is, they, was, uh, they were giving out these blankets and finding ways to infect people, but also herding Native Americans into camps, you know, where the disease would spread very rapidly. So they were absolutely weaponizing disease in these multiple ways. But really, what, it, what is interesting about this, what is kind of just uh, horrendous about it, is that they became very expert in this form of biopolitical warfare, you know, where they actually weaponize uh, non-human entities of various kinds and deploy it against uh, other, other populations, which is what they did to China with Indian opium. You know, with opium grown in, uh, in Bihar and uh, uh, Bihar and Eastern UP and in the Malwa region, and exporting this on a scale unimaginable, unimaginable scale uh, to China. And until recent times, you know, until uh, the 1920s and 30s, they were pushing opium on, uh, on China in this way, and at the same time claiming that they were like the great saviors of the world and so on. Uh, you know, and we still are speaking under their shadow, <laughs> where they brought, uh, you know, catastrophe I couldn't bring myself world. to put a backdrop and cover him. <laughs> So, you know, I, I wanted to talk about the literature, but before that, uh, uh, I just saw a short clip which you had once tweeted out where uh, this uh, gentleman from California kept calling you a climate activist during the interview. I think it was for the Nutmeg's Curse. So, typically, climate change, uh, you know, narratives are all about the future and about how science will solve it. And you have, for the last six, seven years, or perhaps the turning point was the hungry tide. You, you've always said the solutions can't lie merely in finding a scientific or technological solution. 
So the importance of these stories, you know, your both your books, one is a fable of our times and the other one is parables of a planet in crisis. So uh, what, how important are remembering these stories which uh, you mentioned in the Nutmeg's Curse and then we'll go into the next book. Yeah, I mean, uh, see, in the way, there's a complete difference, an absolute gap between the way in which uh, the planetary crisis is perceived in the West and the way that it's perceived in the South. Because in the global South, I mean, I mean, because if you talk to any Westerner about what is this crisis, they'll say, oh, it's all about technology, it's all about uh, technological solutions, it's all about uh, you know, reducing your carbon footprint and finding ways to do it. Now, if you talk to anyone in the global South, you'll get a completely different answer. And, uh, you know, uh, the Malaccas are a very good uh, example of that because, you know, in this island, uh, 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 Ternate, uh, you know, which was uh, the home of the clove forever, and uh, they have a, uh, a dynasty of sultans that's still ex extant, I mean, since the 12th century. And I actually met the, uh, the present incumbent and you know, the, a terrible thing is happening in Ternate. I mean, because of climate change, the clove trees are disappearing. They're dying, literally dying, you know. And uh, I asked many people there, including this, this sultan. I mean, I just asked experimentally because it's kind of interesting to hear the answers. I said, look, your, your clove trees are dying. This is your great, uh, th this, is the, this is your tree of life. Aren't you worried? Uh, don't you want to, uh, uh, wouldn't you, don't you want to shrink your carbon footprint? And the first thing they answer is always, why should we shrink it? You know, our carbon footprint is small anyway, per capita. Uh, it's they who should shrink their carbon footprint because uh, they got rich at our expense uh, when we were weak and poor. Why should we do anything? It's the, the responsibility is on them. So you see, immediately, this, uh, this crisis is perceived as a geopolitical crisis, you know, a crisis of inequity, of geopolitics. It's not seen at all in this technological frame. And I think, you know, I, I go on harping about that, but I really don't think Westerners understand this at all, you know, because uh, they're just not able to understand it. It's a, it's a way of... So, uh, you know, semil so these meets like COP26 or even Davos, do you have any hope from them, you know, because they somehow end in a sense of the solutions being intractable because of these two perspectives, one of the global south saying it's, uh, the problem was uh, aggravated by the, the settlements and the colonizers. So do you see these, uh, you know, they are important, but do you see any solution coming from such uh, forums? I was always very skeptical of the COP process, and now it's perfectly clear that it's just, it's just, it's just nonsense, you know. I mean, this last COP26 in Glasgow, what happened? The three, three of the most important players in the world boycotted it. Xi Jinping, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, and Bolsonaro, and Bolsonaro literally thumbed his nose at it, you know, because he was, he was on holiday in Italy at the time, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, you can't have any climate solution, I mean, th that kind of solution if you don't have these three players on board, you know. All the rest is, I mean, just, just, uh, just talk, I mean, it's just a, 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 a yak. And in fact, uh, what were the... Uh, what were they able to decide on? I mean, it's, you know, these stupid concepts like net zero, which actually mean nothing, you know. So anyone can say, oh, yes, I'll be net zero by, 20, uh, by 2025 or whatever. And it doesn't mean anything. No one can hold you to that because nobody even knows what actually it means, you know. So besides that, you know, the entire system of international politics, if you like, has completely broken down. We have to understand this. This COP26 made it clear. This war in Ukraine has made it even more clear. Look, you can't put half the world under sanctions for various, for various reasons and then expect them to cooperate on something like this. How does, it, how, how does that work? You impose punitive sanctions upon uh, you know, China, Russia, 
uh, Iran, and, the, and then you expect that they're going to sort of come along with you for this, for this ride? Of course not. You know? So this entire process has just catastrophically collapsed. We have to understand that really the only people who were sort of strutting about at COP26 uh, were really, uh, you know, the old um, Anglosphere, you know, the old colonial Anglosphere. And the ways in which they fixed this whole thing, I mean, uh, you know, just like the British uh, during the days of the opium trade, whenever there was any talk of controlling the opium trade, they would always send some Indian bureaucrat you know, who would uh, come up with some fancy arguments. Oh, the Indian peasant will starve if you stop the opium trade, you know. The same way, they, you know, how cleverly Boris Johnson put up an Indian figurehead. You know, it's so strange to see these patterns repeat, you know. So, if anything, I would say this whole entire COP26 process, or this entire process of negotiations on climate change, is eerily, uncannily similar to the processes of, uh, uh, through which uh, you know, the, uh, Anglo settlers uh, negotiated uh, treaties with Native Americans. You know, they would set up a treaty, and then the moment uh, it came time to implement it, they would say, no, 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 we'll change this treaty into that. So just like Kyoto, they did it. You know? They did it uh, again for the Paris Agreement. It's uncannily similar. You know? The uh, hope that is proffered is there is some uh, there is some enlightenment and respect that is now being uh, you know gained by what is called TEK indigenous knowledge of how to deal with uh, climate change, but that too fills you with some skepticism. <laughs> yes, intense skepticism. Sorry. Um, yeah, so there is uh, this talk of TEK and so on. And, uh, uh, you know, the whole, uh, that's called uh, traditional ecological knowledge. So now they've suddenly realized that, yes, actually, uh, you know, the, the native people knew better. So they're trying to sort of revive, uh, let's say, a forest burning, you know, which they had uh, absolutely stamped out for like more than 100 years because that was what German forestry told them. Now it turns out that in Australia, as well as in North America, the native people actually knew better. But by this time, they've exterminated so many native people that hardly anybody remembers those techniques, you know. And in any case, those techniques are not like uh, technologies, you know. Those techniques are rooted in so many kinds of uh, uh, stories, uh, in mythologies, you know. So, you know, you can't revive that technique just as technique. You have to revive the entire culture, you know. Just as, you know, cultivation in India is not uh, just you go and pl uh, plow, uh, plow up the soil. There are various sorts of rites and things that you do, you know, which are closely interconnected with that whole process. So, uh, I mean, I think, uh, you know, this uh, TEK is just uh, another form of appropriation, you know. Uh, and I don't think uh, that, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, I don't think that there's much hope to be had there. So which brings us to the other book we are discussing today, The Living Mountain. It's a short, uh, it's, it, the subtitle is A Fable of Our Times. It's a story about uh, the world in a way and uh, is, like a, is like a companion piece, if I may venture to add, to The Nutmeg's Curse. So how did the living mountain come to life? Well, well, actually what happened, uh, I had written something along those lines, um, uh, you know, way back, I think 10 years ago, uh, and uh, I, I read it out in Singapore, and in fact, uh, they made a play out of it <laughs> in Singapore. Uh, but then I, I just put it aside. And then, uh, you know, a friend of mine who's a sort of leading climate expert, uh, she was, uh, you know, doing this sort of anthology of writing on the Anthropocene. And most of the people who are writing for it are, you know, like the top scientists and so on. So she asked me, <clears throat> and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I couldn't think of anything except this story, you know. So I, um, so I rewrote it, I, I sort of worked on it and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it's going to be a part of that uh, collection, which is coming out from CUP. 
uh, that's the Cambridge University Press. But I also happened to send the story to my, uh, to my editor at HarperCollins. And he loved it and said he wanted to do, a, do it as a book. So here it is. So uh, you, you mentioned that while, uh, while you were giving this up as part of a, a set of uh, articles and talks on climate change, you, know, you, were, you were up against a lot of scientists and experts. So how important is it for stories to tell uh, the story of climate change? How important is it for us to frame the story of climate change as, against the science of it? I think it's very, very important. And, uh, you know, the curious thing is, I mean, my climate scientist friends, uh, they're actually really wonderful people and very humble and uh, hardworking and uh, really but dedicated to this. But, and they constantly say, you have to tell the story. But I don't think they really understand what the story is. I mean, they don't really understand the story themselves. And they're... Often, or, and they don't understand storytelling either. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, their story of climate change is one of going off to Mars, <laughs> you know, quite often. And my story is quite a different story, that Mars is already here. So, you know, the book ends with uh, uh, us uh, presuming that we are going to protect nature from here on. Uh, the high-minded, uh, you know, modern thinking scientist feels that nature has to be protected from man. And you end by saying, have you learned nothing? So is that something, you know, we learned in the city a couple of years ago through the Ampan? And are we going to learn that lesson through many such uh, climate events and catastrophes? Is there any good news? <laughs> well, something I take as a very positive development is that I think, you know, those, all those old assumptions uh, on which modernity was built, on which a certain kind of modernity was built, are actually visibly crumbling, you know? And you see signs of that everywhere. For example, you know, the whole idea, I mean, for, let's say, 200 years, uh, colonialists basically exterminated anyone who thought that the land was alive. You know, can you imagine that in America, which is... Uh, founded on uh, ideas of religious freedom. In fact, the only people who weren't allowed to practice their religion was Native Americans, because their religion was founded ar around, uh, you know, earth beliefs. Uh, but now, suddenly we see that, uh, you know, there's, a very, there's been a very important uh, anti-fossil fuel movement in, uh, uh, in North America, which is known as the uh, No Dakota Pipeline Movement. And this movement, which is led mainly by uh, indigenous women, in fact, has been in extraordinarily effective. It's been one of the very few movements that's actually managed to hold off uh, a pipeline. And I think, and this entire movement is not a traditional political movement at all. It's built around ideas of sacrality and the sacredness of the earth and the sacredness of the water. And that's what's given it this incredible vitality. And I think, you know, even the Occupy movement of 2012 was very much built around ideas of, you know, trying to model different ways of living, different kinds of lives. And we have that here as well. I mean, uh, you know, the Adivasis in Niamgiri managed to resist, uh, uh, you know, mining interests. And what was more, you know, the, uh, the Supreme Court recognized the sacrality of mountains. Similarly, in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, you know, their Supreme Court has recognized the personhood of a river. Uh, and just imagine, I mean, these are sort of old white guy judges, you know, I mean, they, for them, the idea that they're descended from a, from a river must uh, be absurd in personal life, yet they're willing to give it judicial recognition. Uh, in Iceland, a glacier uh, has been given funerary rights. So I do think that we are seeing the breakdown of a certain kind of mechanistic mindset, you know, that came with this whole colonial enterprise. But, uh, so we see all sorts of movements of this kind arising. But again, one shouldn't be Pollyanna-ish. I mean, here in India, today, we have completely adopted these settler colonial uh, uh, strategies of, of so-called development. 
I mean, even though the Niamgiri Adivasis managed to gain a victory or two, look what's happening now in Hasdeo Arand and so on. These last stretches of primary forest are being opened up to mining industries, you know. So, uh, you know, one can't be Pollyanna-ish, you know, but as you said, one must look uh, for whatever good news there is, because frankly, there's very, very little. And if you ask me, <laughs> the most promising sign uh, is that it's now clear that extraterrestrials actually have been visiting the Earth for a long time. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, the American Defense Department has said so. So maybe they'll save us. <laughs> so, you know, now that you're mentioning ETs and, uh, you know, outer, outer space life, uh, your, uh, the nutmeg curse, just to go back, uh, the stories that we can't explain, coincidences, what we call miracles, uh, you mentioned, uh, how do you pronounce it, shaman, shaman? Sh yes, shaman. Shaman. So a shaman said, uh, the bees spoke to him and said that, uh, you know, they are endangered. You know, even I have to admit when I read that, I did kind of roll my eyes. So how do you deal with this? Uh, you know, what we can't explain scientifically, we do not take seriously. How does that mindset break? I don't know if that mindset can break. Look, you know, the human consciousness is a very uh, is a very wide spectrum. I mean, if you take the old Bandanese, uh, for them, they were traders at one level, so the nutmegs were a trade commodity, you know, which they traded with other people. At the same time, it was also something more, so that they sang songs about the nutmeg. The nutmeg was a kind of uh, was a kind of spirit being for them as well. So, you know, the human consciousness ranges over a very wide set of things. So I don't expect that, you know, I mean, a farmer who's plowing his land is at one level doing something very practical. At the same time, when he, when he prays to his plow, uh, he is doing something else altogether, you know, and both those consciousnesses can coexist. And I think the terrible thing is that, you know, what has happened with, with the rise of a certain sort of technological age is that our tools are no longer our tools. We have become, as it were, uh, the tools of our tools. <laughs> you know, they, they now dictate to us. I mean, if you, if you try to think of the idea of, let's say, shutting down the global internet, you know, is it even possible? I mean, would the internet allow itself to be shut down, you know? So it's obviously already attained some form of agency, you know, uh, which we cannot override anymore. But, you know, that other aspect of, uh, of um, human existence was something that in the past was addressed in literature, most of all. And that is what we have lost today, I think, you know. Literature can no longer give voice, if you like, to the uncanny, to the non-human. And you literally cannot give voice to the, uh, the non-human without accepting the notion of the uncanny. Okay, before we open it out, uh, since you mentioned literature, you've spoken about uh, you know, the Victorian authors and uh, uh, you know, in memoriam, there's this po poem which uh, Ronald Reagan uh, quoted from, all of which in many ways unconsciously almost speak about mastering nature. So, uh, again, once again, how important is it to the, the Lord of the Flies, where, you know, these boys stuck on an island uh, turn against each other? And then you mention a real incident in Tonga, where that absolutely did not happen. So, uh, you call to quest in the heart of darkness as well. So, I found that part of uh, the book very interesting, to you know, the way you've broken down these things. And... Uh, also mentioned the Swedish author, Lindqvist, yes, yes. who uh, wrote about uh, Conrad in particular. So uh, is it important to reread these books that are part of our curriculum even in India? It's very important, I think, because, you know, a lot of the flies was a, a text that I had to read in school, you know, a long time ago. Uh, and actually, if you think about it, what, what is the idea there, this whole idea of, uh, you know, that he, to be human, you have to have this huge pressure from above, 
And if that pressure is take, taken away, you become savage in the sense of wanting to kill each other and harm each other and so on. But these, these are not realities. In fact, human beings cooperate. And uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's the other aspect of ourselves. And, uh, you know, maybe if a, if a bunch of English schoolboys was abandoned on an island, they would actually, because they have this cult of individualism and selfishness and so on, that they would kill each other. But, uh, you know, these Tongans, uh, <laughs> a bunch of young Tongans, actually went through this experience, you know. Uh, they, uh, their boat was wrecked, they ended up on an island, and they were just uh, teenagers. And they worked out this elaborate system of looking after each other, um, of growing stuff and sharing stuff. And it wasn't at all like the Lord of the Flies, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> there are many possibilities within human beings, you know. You know, this, this whole sort of discipline of economics has been built upon this idea of uh, selfishness, you know. But uh, as Eleanor Ostrom, uh, you know, the, she also won the Nobel Prize for Economics, as she's shown that, you know, it, every critical situation, in fact, traditional cultures always develop forms of sharing, uh, you know, uh, uh, sharing of the commons and so on. I mean, just imagine that today in California, which is the home of, uh, uh, you know, uh, selfish individualism and a certain kind of modernity, now uh, they have water rationing, actually quite draconian water rationing. And they're not, uh, you know, rising up in arms. You know, I mean, they're, they're dealing with it. So human beings can do that. Well, on that rare note of hope from <laughs> Amitabh, <laughs> can we have some questions? <laughs> Uh, there's one right at the back, one uh, young gentleman. He's, yeah, you shout. Uh, See, if there is no hope, what is the point of what? That, what is the point? Um, I, see, I see what you're saying. See, this idea of hope, it's predicated on a certain kind of... Uh, on, the, on a foundational sort of belief of modernity, which is progress, you know? So this idea of hope and progress, that things will always get better and better and better, they're sort of very int intricately tied. But you know, that is actually a very sort of uh, Western idea, which I think everyone's now absorbed. But when I was a child growing up, we didn't always expect things would get better and better. And I don't think that's in any sense, uh, even within Catholicism, I mean, uh, um, you know, uh, there's no sense in which uh, people expect continual progress. Uh, you know, uh, in, in Catholicism, history is seen as a labyrinth, you know, in which you sort of accidentally bump into uh, all sorts of problems. So nowhere in the human condition has it ever been said that things will always get better and better. And yet we carry on, because if you like, it's our duty, it's our karma. You know, and within that duty, within that karma, we actually find consolations. So that things are getting worse is not entirely a bad thing. And I'm sure you've seen within the pandemic, I mean, it helps you throw out all the waste and the mess in your lives, you know. It helps you throw out the people who are not essential to you, uh, the, 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 you know, all the other stuff that's not essential to you. It makes you rethink the fundamentals. So. You know, I think it's a, one shouldn't think about it as hope or, hope or despair. You should think of it as duty. You know, uh, you live because you have to, and in that you discover all sorts of consolations. Okay, would, uh, yeah, Rudra. There is a mic. Very, very interesting, and when you were talking about and opium. I was also thinking of, you know, we're talking about Assam, but also in UP and Bihar. Uh, both those products uh, brought in to industrial scale and, you know, manufactured and exported. Unlike tea, those are no longer consumed in the scale that it used to. Or, but, and during the, you know, I, I go to Eastern UP a lot and I see opium bungalows, you know, Cornwallis died, um, you know, after, you know, you know, coming back to India, coming to India. 
And those are very poor parts, despite being, you know, when a trade comes in and then when it goes out, you know, like when it, whatever has happened to an extent to tea, uh, gone to Africa and other places. And, you know, the, the effect it leaves on the community uh, with opium, indigo, and tea. Can you talk, talk about that? Uh, sure, absolutely. In fact, I'm writing a book about it right now. Um, uh, see, I, I think uh, opium is very much uh, the resource curse. You know, because the British basically started uh, uh, enforcing a pattern of opium cultivation uh, in Purvanchal. And Purvanchal, that is Bihar and Eastern UP, if we think back in our history, these are the richest parts of the Indian subcontinent. I mean, they're the, uh, it's where Indian civil, it's the heartland of Indian civilization. And it continued to be so until the 18th century. Under colonialism, when they imposed the system, it's a strange thing, you know, uh, my, my books, the Ibis Trilogy, actually have created, a, 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 it, it, it's led to a lot of new research on opium. So I'm now going back to that new research. Uh, and it's very interesting. There was, so there was no complete history of the opium department, you know, uh, that, which ran this mini empire, uh, you know, in, in Purvanchal. And uh, what this historian, he's uh, actually uh, 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 an Austrian historian called R uh, Ralf Bauer, uh, what he shows us is that uh, it was a completely draconian system, you know. It wasn't a plantation, but it wasn't a plantation only because it was too big. You know, it was a gigantic system enforced by the state, you know. So there was incredible surveillance. Basically, the entire population was criminalized. And these, uh, these peasants who are producing this opium are producing it below cost, you know. So they are actually incurring debts in order to produce this opium. This opium which is making fantastic fortunes for people elsewhere for, of course, uh, a lot of the British merchants, but also for, for n number of American merchants. Actually, that's the really interesting part, the degree to which American capitalism is built on uh, Indian opium. You know, all these major families, for example, uh, uh, the Delanos, uh, the Coolidges, uh, so many of the most important uh, I mean, <laughs> presidential, I mean, you know, FDR's uh, great-grandfather uh, was one of the biggest opium merchants in China. So, uh, you know, the degree to which opium underwrote uh, British capitalism and Indian capitalism, virtually every major, uh, every major industrial house uh, in Western India at some point was dealing with opium. You know, that's where they made their, uh, they basically made their money uh, from. You know, their seed capital came from that. So, uh, you know, but for the peasant, it was an absolute, again, a resource curse. And I think you can literally trace the poverty of uh, not just Purvanchal, but I will also say Eastern India uh, to this opium trade. Because in the 19th century, uh, opium was the biggest business in Calcutta, by far. You know? It was the major center for the exporting of opium uh, through um, uh, you know, the opium department, because they held their auctions here. But, Basically, local people were not allowed to participate. Uh, it was either expatriate, uh, expatriate Westerners or expatriate uh, uh, people from Western India because they were growing their own opium, so they had uh, a lot of uh, experience with it. And actually, that's what led uh, to uh, the in-migration, if you like, uh, of people from Western India into, uh, into Calcutta on a large scale. So it's a very interesting thing, the way that opium is actually knit into the fabric of our economy, our history, and yet it's never really sort of addressed at all. And you say that opium is consumed. See, again, this is the, really the interesting thing. I mean, the British deployed, uh, and even before them, the Dutch uh, deployed the opium poppy as literally as a kind of biopolitical weapon, you know, against the people of Southeast Asia and the people of China. And, but, you know, they thought that they were in control, but they were never in control. It's the poppy that's in control. And today, uh, the, in fact, opium is the world, one, just about the world's largest industry. You know, it runs everything. I mean, what defeated, uh, what defeated the US and Afghanistan? It was basically the opium poppy, uh, you know? And today it's ineradicable. 
it's completely seized uh, all our populations. I mean, in America, they've been fighting uh, heroin uh, for like decades. There's more, more heroin consumed today in America than ever before. You know, uh, this, uh, the American Supreme Court passed a judgment against the Sackler family for, uh, for, for, uh, for their prescription opioids. But prescription opioid death has been rising ever since, even after the, uh, even after, uh, the, the banning of the Sackler family. So, uh, you know, even more than climate change, actually, what is really kind of uncanny, if you see it, is the complete hold uh, that the opium poppy has established upon human beings. We will never be able to, and today in India, we have a crisis of unprecedented proportions, you know, especially in the Punjab. Uh, you know, I mean, any, you, you will have noticed that in the last few elections in the Punjab, uh, heroin addiction was a major issue. And this thing is so dangerous, you know, especially the next level, fentanyl. You can die if you touch it. You know, it's, so this is the thing about the opium poppy, that unlike uh, uh, synthetic substances, it has this uncanny ability to increase its power and its addictiveness, you know. So, uh, you know, this is something to be very, very scared of because I don't think that our, in, the only country th that was able to battle mass opium uh, uh, addiction was China. I don't think any country anywhere is ever going to be able to battle it again. Uh, I think there's a question from uh, Shukantuda, yes. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to take you up on uh, your uh, point that there was relatively little terraforming during colonial times in India. Now, I think there was a great deal, and the crucial thing is it's not in sort of a hyped off historical process. It's continuing and worsening down to the present day. Say, uh, for instance, the matter of plantations, you mentioned the tea plantations, but uh, the, the, uh, the creation of plantations is going on to the present day and increasing partly for its compensation, you know, this kind of compensatory tree planting that is supposed to be carried out for the environmental damage caused by industry. Much of it is actually um, ensuring further corporate profits by creating plantations, replacing a complete varied biosphere by monoculture. Okay? This is a very uh, critical point that I think the nation needs to engage with. The other thing is that, you know, for in British times and since, huge tracts of forest land were cleared for agriculture. And that is the basis, for instance, of Bibhuti uh, work, Autumn, Autumn Book. See, it's, it's not just nostalgia for a vanishing forest. The narrator is actually there as the key agent who's making the forest vanished. He's employed by a corporation which is clearing the forests, creating agricultural land, and importing people to settle on the land. Okay? And that process is continuing through mining on a huge scale and through urbanization. You mentioned Bombay, but it's not just Bombay and Mumbai. It is above all maybe our city, Kolkata, which has been drastically terraformed through its history. I mean, it, this was entirely marshland, wetland. Okay? And now gradually that wetland has been pushed back to, well, but it's still there within a few kilometers of where we are sitting today. And so the entire ecological kind of uh, um, thrust of the this entire region is being pushed further and further back into a smaller and smaller territory. And when that, the current wetlands disappear, as it is doing on a huge scale every day, um, then it's a question of how the city will survive. And in various ways, there are similar problems elsewhere with the rivers, the waterways in Chennai, with the lakes in Bengaluru. So I think there's this tremendous amount of terraforming that uh, in both colonial times and down to this day is increasing. Uh, I agree with you. But I think there is a difference between the terraforming of the, North, uh, of the Americas uh, and the terraforming that, we've see, that we saw uh, uh, in, uh, in India. See, uh, in the Americas, the whole idea was that, uh, they're that, they, that they're recreating Europe, you know, that they're recreating a European uh, landscape in a, in a completely different continent, on, you know, in a completely different kind of environment. I don't think that they were trying to do that in the same way here. So that I think if you 
were a 17th century person and you came to, let's say, let's say Madhya Pradesh or wherever, the, the terrain would not be unrecognizable, you know? Whereas if you were a 17th century person and you went to New England, the terrain would be completely unrecognizable. I mean, the terrain is absolutely now Europeanized in a way that hasn't happened here to that degree. So that's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. The second thing is that, you know, that terraforming is a part of a process of biopolitical warfare. Whereas colonial wars in India were not biopolitical in the same sense. Uh, you know, basically it was humans fighting humans, uh, you know, with swords and stuff. Whereas uh, in, uh, in the Americas, they were constantly using, uh, you know, non-human entities, you know, as weapons. So those are the two different points I, I, I would make. But uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, the whole scale of what is happening today uh, in, uh, in India, it's just, uh, it's just beyond imagining, really. There's a question right at the back. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Um, the nutmeg curse compared to the Kohinoor's curse. Uh, your comments on that? <laughs> well, I think it's quite similar. I mean, uh, I was going to ask: Is it the same curse? Uh, no, it's a different curse. <laughs> so, what is the difference? Uh, well, I mean, the Kohinoor's curse only affected a few families, <laughs> whereas. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yeah. Uh, from, the writing, from the writing perspective, so uh, if I would say that on, a, on what basis, like how do you choose your topics? Like what, what, are, what are the thoughts that come to your hand when you uh, choose what to write on about a novel or how do you approach a research? I would like to know from the writing perspective. Uh, um, well, I, I wish I could explain that. Uh, I don't think one can, but when you get ideas about something that you want to write, uh, my, first, uh, my first step is to sort of really find out everything I can about it. So I do do a lot of research. I like to travel to all the places I'm writing about. And that's, uh, that, that for me is one of the most fulfilling aspects of writing. Uh, that sh we have time for just one more question. Yes, there's a lady at the back. Yeah, my question is is really taking a step back and, you know, through many of your books and what you've been talking about, the idea of us and them, uh, that continues very strongly uh, over, over the millennia, really. So we're talking about, let's say, the, the, the conquerors and the colonized or the West and the East or the West and the global South. And whatever... Um, attempts at bridges seem to be more of, of a very self-conscious inclusion, attempts at inclusion. So uh, how do you see, do you see it as this us and them will always be there or would, would there really be a true uh, global one family approach really? Well, uh, you tell me, I mean. Uh, I know it's a very, uh, idealistic approach that I'm talking about, but we do talk about it uh, so much. We talk about us all being one big, great, big uh, global family working for the earth and so on and so forth. But in reality, the ground reality is really so much of us and them. And the, there is that socio-historic background to it. Do you see those those fissures mending? Do you see, uh, do you see us really uh, believing that we, we are uh, together in this journey on Earth and Mars next. Uh, I'm sorry to say that actually as things get worse, uh, what's become very clear is that uh, in fact people are becoming much, much more tribal. Uh, you know, just look at the difference between the reception of Ukrainian refugees in Europe and what happened with the Syrian refugees, you know. There's such a huge difference. Uh, similarly, if you look at the way that the U.S. is now, I mean, this whole migration rhetoric has escalated there in relation to Mexico, even though for almost a decade now, there are more Mexicans leaving America than coming in. You know, it's kind of an absurdity, but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a sort of tribalism, if you like. We've seen a lot of the same thing over here. And uh, I'm afraid I think these uh, fissures are only going to get worse. You know, as the planetary crisis uh, intensifies, 
Uh, sadly, I don't think people are going to uh, are going to turn their anger upon the real causes, which is you know like fossil fuels and uh, certain patterns of industrialization. Uh, they're going to just vent it on minorities. Okay, uh, that's not a very happy note to end. But There's nothing happy in any of this, honestly. <laughs> So it's a little inappropriate of me to smile and thank you. But thank you so much, Amitabh. Uh, may you continue uh, writing wonderful books on troubling matters. And, uh, uh, you know, thank you so much for doing this. We, I didn't, it's my uh, fault. I didn't realize this is the first event on this book. So for a photo op, uh, you hold the, the English version and there's uh, simultaneously uh, we have Mahaparvat, which is the Hindi translation of the book. So, uh, yes, the Hindi book is wonderful. And there are some words which are so natural in Hindi, I have to say, like the, the adept becomes Kalavati, which was very lovely. And the last lines are so, so beautiful. Ye tumhe kuch sikhane ki koshish karta raha hai, aur usse tumne kuch bhi nahi sikha, kuch bhi nahi sikha. I mean, those lines are, I have to say, the translator has done a wonderful yeah. job of the original. Both these books, as well as other titles of Amitav Ghosh, are available at the bookstore. You can buy it against your membership card and other ways. So uh, once you've done that, he's happy to sign, and a brunch awaits those who've booked. Thank you so much, Amitav. Any final thoughts? Well, thank you. <laughs> it's so nice to do this here in Kolkata. So thank you all very much for coming. A uh, vote of thank will be uh, uh, given by Rudro Chatterjee on behalf of the Bengal Club. Uh, thank you, uh, Maladi. And I, on behalf of the club, would request you to do more of these programs. You know, these kind of programs make, uh, as you can see from the number of members who have come today, um, 11.30 on a Sunday morning, uh, this, these are the programs for which Bengal Club uh, would turn up in uh, maximum numbers. So I would request you to have these kind of programs. You know, this uh, discussion was fantastic. And uh, uh, all of you, you know, whenever Mr. Amitabh Ghosh comes, we would love to have you, you know, be, uh, you know speaking about the same or new books. These kind of conversations, you know, sitting here in Kolkata, are rare, and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much you. for uh, having it. The discussion on you know, what's happening to our planet, what's happening to the way we look at civilization, you know, these conversations has been a theme of you know, several books. And we'd like to con you know, continue the conversation. And as a club, maybe you know, get together, you know, weave stories, or create a movement. Because it's not just you know, rational or scientific you know, solutions, but community solutions. And we'd love to work on these themes and have these discussions. You know, let's start this conversation. And thank you for coming and doing this today. Thank you. Thanks.